And now, something useful for dog owners. A Japanese toy company has invented a gadget which will be able to identify your pet's emotions from the way it barks and then translate this into human words. It can identify six feelings sadness, joy, fear, need, happiness, and frustration. Dr. Suzuki, who invented the gadget, says there might be some problems with translating the emotions of puppies. When it was tried out on young dogs, there were quite a lot of mistakes. But in the case of adult dogs, the translation is almost 100% correct. The gadget is quite simple. It has a microphone which is placed on the dog's neck and something like a mobile phone for pet owners to carry. When the dog barks, the microphone records the sound, transmits the data to the gadget, and a special computer program analyzes it. The first gadget was created two years ago, and more than 300,000 have been sold so far. The latest model will hit the shops in Japan in August. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are no plans to sell an English or any other language version, so dog lovers who don't speak Japanese will need to depend on their dog's body language instead. And now, something useful for dog owners. A Japanese toy company has invented a gadget which will be able to identify your pet's emotions from the way it barks and then translate this into human words. It can identify six feelings, sadness, joy, fear, need, happiness and frustration. Dr. Suzuki, who invented the gadget, says there might be some problems with translating the emotions of puppies. When it was tried out on young dogs, there were quite a lot of mistakes. But in the case of adult dogs, the translation is almost 100% correct. The gadget is quite simple. It has a microphone which is placed on the dog's neck and something like a mobile phone for pet owners to carry. When the dog barks, the microphone records the sound, transmits the data to the gadget and a special computer program analyzes it. The first gadget was created two years ago and more than 300,000 have been sold so far. The latest model will hit the shops in Japan in August. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are no plans to sell an English or any other language version, so dog lovers who don't speak Japanese will need to depend on their dog's body language instead. We asked a group of young people to share their experience of renting a flat. Here's what they said. Speaker 1. When I rented a flat, I decided to share it with five other people. I didn't have to pay much, but it created other problems I hadn't thought about before. I had to get up at 5am to take a shower before everyone else did. I couldn't go to sleep early because they studied till late with all the lights on almost every night. After a few months, I just couldn't stand it any longer and moved out. It looks like living with others is not for me. Speaker 2 For me, renting a flat was no fun at all. I dreamt of being on my own, but it turned out to be a nightmare. The rent was very high and I had to pay all the bills myself, so I needed a job. I studied during the week, so the only option was to work all Saturday and Sunday. After work, I always came back home exhausted and didn't have the time or energy for entertainment or learning for exams. Now I know that sharing a flat with somebody makes much more sense when you're at university. Speaker 3 I rented a flat when I got my first job away from home. I earned a lot, so money was not a problem. What I liked most about renting was that I could do what I wanted, when I wanted. I could sleep until midday and wear pyjamas all day long. If I wanted to watch films in the middle of the night, I didn't have to ask my parents for permission. They used to control everything I did, and I hated that. Speaker 4 For some people, renting a flat means never-ending parties, especially when you have a few flatmates. But I lived alone. 
I had to do all the cleaning around the flat on my own, and I really hated that. It was so tiring and time-consuming. After graduation, I moved back to my parents. Now I feel free. I don't have to do any washing or cooking because my mum does everything. I just tidy my room from time to time. Speaker 5 When I rented a flat, I decided it would be cheaper for me to share it. It was a difficult decision for a shy person like me. But the people I lived with were easygoing and we got on really well. Thanks to them, I started to feel more comfortable with people around and to go out more often. We often went cycling together and had a party from time to time. We're still in touch and I can always count on them. I have my own flat now, but I don't enjoy it so much and there's nobody to share the bills with. We asked a group of young people to share their experience of renting a flat. Here's what they said. Speaker 1. When I rented a flat, I decided to share it with five other people. I didn't have to pay much, but it created other problems I hadn't thought about before. I had to get up at 5am to take a shower before everyone else did. I couldn't go to sleep early because they studied till late, with all the lights on almost every night. After a few months, I just couldn't stand it any longer and moved out. It looks like living with others is not for me. Speaker 2 For me, renting a flat was no fun at all. I dreamt of being on my own, but it turned out to be a nightmare. The rent was very high and I had to pay all the bills myself, so I needed a job. I studied during the week, so the only option was to work all Saturday and Sunday. After work, I always came back home exhausted and didn't have the time or energy for entertainment or learning for exams. Now I know that sharing a flat with somebody makes much more sense when you're at university. Speaker 3 I rented a flat when I got my first job away from home. I earned a lot, so money was not a problem. What I liked most about renting was that I could do what I wanted, when I wanted. I could sleep until midday and wear pyjamas all day long. If I wanted to watch films in the middle of the night, I didn't have to ask my parents for permission. They used to control everything I did, and I hated that. Speaker 4. For some people, renting a flat means never-ending parties, especially when you have a few flatmates. But I lived alone. I had to do all the cleaning around the flat on my own, and I really hated that. It was so tiring and time-consuming. After graduation, I moved back to my parents. Now I feel free. I don't have to do any washing or cooking because my mum does everything. I just tidy my room from time to time. Speaker 5 When I rented a flat, I decided it would be cheaper for me to share it. It was a difficult decision for a shy person like me. But the people I lived with were easygoing and we got on really well. Thanks to them, I started to feel more comfortable with people around and to go out more often. We often went cycling together and had a party from time to time. We're still in touch and I can always count on them. I have my own flat now, but I don't enjoy it so much and there's nobody to share the bills with. Today we're talking to Jeff Roberts, a mountain climber born without his left arm who is going to climb Mount Everest next month. Jeff, when did you get interested in mountain climbing? I was a keen runner in secondary school, but when I went to university I realised that I might try something different, something more exciting. There was a climbing club in the town where I studied. I signed up and that's how my climbing adventure started. Of course, I didn't dream about climbing Mount Everest then. That happened much later. Shortly after finishing my studies, 
I went on my first date with Emily, now my wife, to the cinema. We watched the film Everest. On that day, I became absolutely fascinated by this beautiful mountain. And here I am today, ready to climb it. What are you doing to prepare for your Mount Everest climb? I train regularly. Every day I take a six-mile walk in the countryside. On Saturday and Sunday, I have more free time, so I also do two hours of working out in the gym. I need to lose a few kilos, and physical activity works better for me than going on any special diet. I've never been good at dieting anyway. Twice a week, I also practice yoga. I know that being fit is not enough. The success of a climb like this depends a lot on a person's state of mind. And how do people react when they hear what you've planned to do? Actually, I've become quite famous as a disabled climber, so nobody has tried to stop me. Just the opposite. I usually hear words of encouragement and motivation. My wife has also helped me a lot. When I decided to climb Everest, I was even offered a large sum of money to advertise some climbing equipment, but I refused to accept it. My goal is to prove to myself that I can get to the top. If I make it, I will be really proud, and that's enough. I'm not doing it for anyone else, and I'm not interested in making money out of it. Is there any special assistance you need for the climb? Do you have to take anything other climbers don't need? No, I don't need any medical support or special equipment, if that's what you mean. I'm doing a standard climb with a Sherpa guide, a native man who will carry my backpack and other stuff. All other Everest climbers get such assistance. I don't need anybody else to help me reach the top. Thank you for your time, Jeff. Today we're talking to Jeff Roberts, a mountain climber born without his left arm, who is going to climb Mount Everest next month. Jeff, when did you get interested in mountain climbing? I was a keen runner in secondary school, but when I went to university I realised that I might try something different, something more exciting. There was a climbing club in the town where I studied. I signed up and that's how my climbing adventure started. Of course, I didn't dream about climbing Mount Everest then. That happened much later. Shortly after finishing my studies, I went on my first date with Emily, now my wife, to the cinema. We watched the film Everest. On that day, I became absolutely fascinated by this beautiful mountain, and here I am today, ready to climb it. What are you doing to prepare for your Mount Everest climb? I train regularly. Every day I take a six-mile walk in the countryside. On Saturday and Sunday I have more free time, so I also do two hours of working out in the gym. I need to lose a few kilos and physical activity works better for me than going on any special diet. I've never been good at dieting anyway. Twice a week I also practice yoga. I know that being fit is not enough. The success of a climb like this depends a lot on a person's state of mind. And how do people react when they hear what you've planned to do? Actually, I've become quite famous as a disabled climber, so nobody has tried to stop me. Just the opposite. I usually hear words of encouragement and motivation. My wife has also helped me a lot. When I decided to climb Everest, I was even offered a large sum of money to advertise some climbing equipment, but I refuse to accept it. My goal is to prove to myself that I can get to the top. If I make it, I will be really proud, and that's enough. I'm not doing it for anyone else, and I'm not interested in making money out of it. Is there any special assistance you need for the climb? Do you have to take anything other climbers don't need? No. I don't need any medical support or special equipment, if that's what you mean. I'm doing a standard climb with a Sherpa guide, a native man who will carry my backpack and other stuff. All other Everest climbers get such assistance. I don't need anybody else to help me reach the top. Thank you for your time, Jeff.